Wheelan. Hello, everyone. I'm Sinead Wheelahan, and today it is July 16th, 2021, and we are here with the wonderful Xiao Ma, who is both Chinese and Australian. Xiao, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to finally meet you in person. This is how it happens <laughs> during COVID times. Um, Grant and I are very happy to have you here. And just so everybody knows, I'm going to be sort of running the interview because Grant is having some tech problems. So, uh, so bear with me, everybody. Um, thank you so, so much for inviting me, Sunid, and thank you so much, Brent, for inviting me. Very. Oh, we're uh, just delighted pleasure. to have you. You're, yes. We're delighted thank to you. have you. Thank you. And you are the director of the International Chinese UFO Association. You're a lawyer, you're an experiencer, you're a researcher. So Grant had a question, which was, what is a lawyer in Australia doing in uh, investigating and researching Chinese ufology? So maybe you can tell us kind of your origin story. You know, how did you get into this and how did you start the International Chinese UFO Association? Uh, sorry, I think that, uh, there might be some misinformation uh, uh, here. So I'm no longer the director of the International Chinese UFO Association. I, I like to correct that part. And that association existed pr uh, previously, but I resigned from that role. Uh, to be honest, it's a bit of, you know, too much people politics in between. So I decided to leave you know, just, just want to focus on UFO research and share information with others. So I'm no longer carrying on that role, uh, but you are correct on that part. That association did exist before. Uh, regarding my role, uh, yes, I'm an attorney based in Sydney, Australia. Um, still are to date. Um, yeah, so that's that's my background information. And I'm, a, I'm a Chinese, and then I uh, came to Australia during my high school time graduate from uni, now work as attorney. So that's the background information. Am I missing anything? Sorry, what's your question again? Well, kind of, you know, what was your, what is your origin story about how you came into ufology, right? You're a lawyer. So people yeah. wouldn't know, normally associate lawyers with people who are into ufology, right? There's, the, there's a lot of kind of stigmatized ideas about the kind of people that are involved in ufology. So being a lawyer, that is your profession, your chosen profession, yet you have this passion for ufology and you really dedicated so much time to it. So what led you down this path? What happened in your life that brought you here? Thank you. People are actually quite right or wrong on that point because true, like doctors and lawyers are very logical thinking mindset, which could really be the roadblock for us getting to spirituality because everything is reasoning, logic. It's actually not really great for spiritual you know, journey. But sometimes we just have to be more open towards this field. And to be honest, when I have a chat with my previous colleague in law firms, they are actually really look into those spiritual things. So a lot of lawyers and even legal um, supporting staff, they are very tuned in to these things, even though they may not admit because that makes them sounds less professional or sounds quite weird or per se, not yeah. like in a law firm stick with the party line. But Privately speaking, when we go out for lunch, a lot of time we do talk about this kind of thing. So a lot of like attorneys are, are quite open. In terms of my journey, um, I uh, after my graduation, I was very lucky to join a, a, a quite sizable law firm in Sydney. And then one day I traveled to Brisbane office for work. Um, funny enough, I like uh, you may heard about Mary Rodwell, which is a very famous UFO researcher in Australia. Mary also mentioned that city called Brisbane is actually a hot spot for UFO sightings. Mm -hmm. So I arrived in my little office, you know, got a window view. I just been pulled into that, got like telepathic message or something like maybe I should just stop work and uh, look outside the window. I just got that, you know, whether you call it download or just a quick spark an idea. So I was like, yeah, let me look outside. And then I saw very standard round ball, spear shape, um, gray color UFO floating on top of uh, a park-like place, which is quite close towards our office. And I stared at that things for quite a few seconds. You know, it, right, I was a very logical person, very into the whole matrix bullshit things. It's like, what is this? It took me literally quite a few seconds to come up with an idea. Would that be possible that people call it as a UFO? So, and 
that for me as a during that time totally blocked person you know fixing to matrix that's the i call it spiritually speaking an initiation to a possible you know reality and then i start to open my mind hang on maybe there is something that i don't understand so uh, you know as a lawyer we love to do research you know oh you know, I need to check online. What is this? Let me do some quick research. I watch a lot of YouTube channels and it's very similar like the one you and the Graham have, you know, I, I, I watch it, I follow that, I read books, try to understand what is UFO. So that moment, the UFO sighting, uh, Sydney, is my initiation into spirituality. So some people may have a near-death experience. That's how they open up. For me, it's UFO sighting. And that made me actually become a very humble person because I understand that's something that I don't understand. I know my limitation. I need to understand what that is. So uh, that is my uh, sort of break entry, the initiation into this whole community and the spiritual journeys. Wow. And I mean, a lot of people have experiences, right? That we've learned that. Uh, more and more over the over especially in recent years it's a global community of experiencers blossoms which it is currently doing it is growing at a really rapid rate and people are connecting with each other all over the world you and I and I think Grant have talked about uh, how you know we need to have more voices and more global voices in this conversation to find ways of connecting so lots of people have experiences like this but not everybody is so driven to start an organization and become the director of it and build resources and you know what led you to what was it about that experience that made you feel that committed that you were willing to dedicate this time and these many years of your life to create these things to bring you where you are now thank you <clears throat> you know um i wasn't a very brave person to be completely honest i was just one well, of fixing that reality i don't want to be viewed as so-called weirdo in the law firm. So I stopped talking about this kind of thing because, you know, I could be the next lunchtime laughing stock for my colleagues. Oh my God, you know, Xiao said that she, you know, she saw a UFO, how funny. So the colleague connection is very important, but I also want to let people know, this is the truth, this is what happened to me. So what I actually did is I reached out to Mary, you know, that time I watched Mary's YouTube and she seems like a very nice person. I dropped her an email. So, and then she guided me to uh, a local association in New South Wales, which is in Sydney, and attended and it did different groups. That's how gradually I got into the community. So the point I want to make here is during our whole journey, there will be quite a few key persons play a big role in our life transitioning point. Mary Rockwell, obviously, is one of the key persons that show me the doorway you know this could be the way you could look into this which i'm very grateful and uh, and then after that i met you know um new south well i think it's called a ufo new south well association something around the line I attended their events and they have a support group i to be honest i learned a lot from those support groups about what to do is right and what not to do and the people sometimes have very strong view about this is the absolute truth. And the other person, this is the truth. <laughs> sometimes they even were getting the physical fight just, just for the sake of their, you know, what they believe on. And uh, sorry, maybe I talk a bit more. And that was for quite a few years, but it's too much for me because um, I learned what I need to learn, but I'm not really getting into those sporty, you know, politics and people fight stuff. And then I got an invite from a friend of mine in China. And he said, look, uh, um, I run a, like a YouTube dish platform in China. And uh, I heard about you have this very interesting experience and you are based in Sydney. Um, would you be interested to share with the local people about your experience? One of the major reasons, funny enough, Grant and the CC is that I didn't actually notice why I have this, like, I, like, as a lawyer, it's actually very important because Asian countries like Japan, China, Korea, they do value credential a lot. Mm -hmm. So I finally got interviewed, you know, and I told them, no, this is my real name. My name is this and this, my legal name. 
and I'm based on where, and I told them my location, not process residential address, but location. This is my occupation. So I go with my heart feel like, I know I'll be loved by all the Chinese, but I need to tell you guys the truth. So that's how I share the information. I think why I've become that bold is, I think like you and the grand, um, I believe we've been guided by super, like a higher power, you know, Know, gradually push you to get into this field and again I have to overcome my shortcomings you know I was so chicken out like I don't want to share this and that sometimes we just have to be a bit bold have to face all the possibilities and that's for me it's a graduate process you just have to push yourself bit by bit yeah yeah especially when you're dealing with an entity as powerful as the Chinese government I mean you know, I certainly understand why you want to be careful, right? So that that makes complete sense. And actually, that kind of helps me segue into my next question, which is, you know, you are a Chinese national born and raised there until I believe you said you were 17. when We were chatting before we started recording this. And, um, and you've been in Australia ever since. And so why not dive into Australian ufology? Why focus on China on, and, and where you uh, were born but no longer live. What is it about that that compels you more? And that really is going to help us move into the next section of our conversation, yeah. which is, you know, we're here to talk about Chinese yes. ufology and there's some fascinating things going on with the Chinese government. So please answer that question for me to kind of yeah. set the tone for the rest of the conversation. Why not ufology uh, in, in Australia? Why Chinese ufology? You know, I, I I never actually planned anything in my life journey, to be honest. Even the first sight into now, everything just unfolded naturally. I never pushed that hard. Like I push for my braveness, you know, I push I need to be more bold, but I don't push for events to happen. Everything happened just naturally. So why in Australia? Yeah, I do I attend those events, but I'm not like crazy diehard US even like yeah i'm really into this not really to be honest like i watch those things i do my analogy i think about it you know i live as it is um i know quite a few famous figures in australia in america in other country now i know you and the uh, grant now so that's about yeah like people ask me i share some of my view because they see me interestingly they see me as like wow you know in, in australia we've got asian in our UFO association. So they, they, they don't see that many Asian faces. Mm -hmm. So they do ask me, what is your Chinese view about this whole topic? So I do share with them privately, but that's about, yeah, nothing really become big in Australia for me. So I just leave it as it is, you know, I got Monday to Friday job, that's it. But things happen in China, that would be unexpected, to be honest. My first, uh, the boom was, I wrote an article back in 2015 about UFO and aliens. Short article, very, you know, very entry stuff. You know, what is, who is Syrian look like? Where are they based? Pleiadians, Arcturians, and the many different races. Short article, you know, I submitted, I thought maybe there would be 500 people read my articles. I don't know, let's see. Then 2015. And mind you, we're talking about release article in China so many major like media created that information i calculated roughly there are more than 1 million clicks so in china this is big because we're not talking about in the western world you know you, uh, information just flow but in china it's a very controlled regime for a click on ufo article for 1 million this is huge so that time's like oh wow my god i wasn't know you know my first article can reach that number and then people invite me, you know, for the first interview. And the first interview I did, it, bam, just go haywire. Like just people email me, thousands of email coming, blah, blah, blah. This happened to me, this happened to me. Wow. I think the issue with China is my life journey is I never plan any event to happen. I just let it flow. Um, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, life plan or whatever. Uh, but I do see you right. Certain personality traits like me, and the fact that I'm based in Sydney, Australia, give me maybe more sort of leverage to do these things. Otherwise, I may end up in jail. 
which I'm happy to share more later. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you've mentioned uh, to both Grant and myself, I just want to acknowledge, by the way, Grant is here to the audience, but he's having some technology issues. So he's going to jump in when he can. Just want to say that again. Um, but you have mentioned that, you know, you've personally known people who have been insiders, really important insiders, and uh, and then they have disappeared, you know, so it, it is really scary. And, and actually, this is so fascinating, too, because it's not just scary, you know, that that's an easy term or word to throw in that direction. But, you know, there is so much complexity going on in China on a number of different levels, societally, culturally, politically. Uh, you know, what's happening in Hong Kong, and now there's movement towards Taiwan, you know, there's political movement that China is, is taking uh, to take over land and have more power and emerging as, as a world superpower. At the same time, you know, as you're, and as you're mentioning, a very controlled uh, narrative emerges from the country, like whatever comes out is very tightly controlled, yet yes. in the underbelly of the country, there seems to be this really uh, rapidly rising democratic movement kind of of people, you know, going online and speaking up more and doing things like posting videos of UFOs. So that has allowed people in other countries to find out that there's been a rapidly rising number of UFOs in China. Maybe you can talk about that, you know, what the patterns and the trends have been looking like, because I'm amazed at what I read. I did not expect it to be that active. So um, yes, please speak to that. You know, yeah. it's really incredible the amount of activity going on. Sure. I think, uh, thank you for your question. I think your comments can break into two questions. The first one is about the current situation, you know, in China about UFO community. So let me address the first one. People actually don't really know about China because they just read those CN news about what the China communist is like. So the Chinese U- uh, UFO community is literally 30 years behind the Western world, not because they don't have that kind of content, the content is massive, very frequent, all sorts of being just like the Western world. But the issue is to do with the control. So there are two people I want to highlight. There's a there's a lady, she's I think she's 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 I think around late 40s or 50s. She she's a highly educated lady, but she's really getting to like a fituration of light, you know, those pretty things. She was really popular in China prior to my time, you know, and she really talked about it. She really opened, stepped forward. And eventually she's being sentenced for eight years in jail on two grounds. One is uh, tried to over, uh, what's that called? The overturn the governmental regime or some, some something like that. The second part is is for uh, something like a promoting uh, illegal cult, like a religious cult. Mm. So the government point of view is the UFO alien is a cult movement. That's how they define it. So you see that lady who like me, uh, but she joined the community prior to me. Uh, she promoted those ideas and shared information. Nothing really sensitive, you know, the galactic filtration of light, you know, police from this and that. Mm-hmm. And YouTube is fine. You can see all those information flying around, but not in China. She's been sentenced in jail for eight years. And the second person, as I mentioned, regarding um, alleged, um, I use the word of alleged insiders. Um, you know, we heard about that person and uh, last year, September, um, from what my friends told me, and that person is disappeared. We can't find that person anymore. So we tried to reach out to him, no response. Uh, my friends tried to contact that person, can't find him anymore. So you see, that's the situation in China. It's, it's a very similar to 30 or 20 years ago, Grant. Uh, since it's like, you know, Carla Turner, you know, she was being, you know, she's gone mm-hmm. because of the events. So during that time in US in the Western world, they are strictly prohibit people to explore the UFO community, things like that. But we're talking about like back in 1980s, you know, something like that. But now, you know, so many YouTubers that talk about this, they can't stop us. It's like a half open, they never admit to it. But at least in the Western world, you can just jump on YouTube and talk to me, we talk to each other. But it's not the case in China. Mm-hmm. And I reckon that's from my, you know, perspective. I think that's why I've got this tough role. 
firstly because of my credentials as a so-called lawyer it's it's just a common job but people may think oh you got a bit of that little bit of credential you know i'm not a phd and uh and uh, the second point is i'm actually based in sydney australia you see i'm not in mainland china so i can speak chinese i can talk about it i can share but if i'm based in mainland china i will get in big trouble so i think uh our life journey is actually pre-planned. It's very interesting why I'm this location doing these things. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. That's, that's my answer for that. Yeah, I think many people in this community would probably say, you know, of course that's not an accident. These things are not accidents, right? Like that there's a lot of discussion about synchronicities and um, things that are just too odd or too strange or too, coincidental you know apparently coincidental to yeah. not have meaning and you know it does grant and i talked about that too you know the fact that we're alive at this particular yeah. time that we're here on earth at this particular time while these incredible things are happening you know this is a time unlike any other nobody has seen this sort of activity being you know ufology in terms of ufology being acknowledged by worldwide governments on this scale before so if we're if we're talking about the Chinese government and the, the um, activity in China, there was a burst. I was kind of hoping this is this is a bit selfish on my part because um, one of the things I found when I was researching was just this really fascinating bump or crop. I don't know what you would call it, the cluster of uh, of UFO sightings in China, and there were three simultaneous sightings that occurred by pilots. Um, one was I've got it written down actually. I just thought this was so amazing. Um, yes, I, I saw this, actually, I found this after you sent your favorite sighting, which is from uh, Nanjing, I believe that's your favorite one, <laughs> so we can talk about that, but that led me to, you know, every video you sent us to, to look at before we did this interview with you led me to something else, of course, we'd go down the, the internet rabbit hole, so I found out about this, um, this sighting, there was a blue, a blue light alongside a plane, this is in, uh, sorry, 2002, not 2010, but there was another big rash of sightings in 2010, um, 80 kilometers north of Nanjing. And at exactly the same time, another white blue skateboard shaped craft was seen by a pilot alongside another plane. And then that was 120 kilometers away. And then 300 kilometers away from that, there was another sighting. So these were all happening at exactly the same time in different provinces, but still you know, this, this amazing amount of sightings happening at the same time. And that has been reported as happening multiple times in China. So yeah. what is going on with that? You know, there are so many sightings and group sightings. What is the deal? Can you tell us? 2002, my goodness, I'm probably in the middle school. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, activities in China. So I need to see that video in order to comment. But I do agree with you that there are so many things happening in China regarding UFO and alien activities. So uh, I don't think, so I just wanna, for you and the grand the viewer know that based on the, all the information I've collected from my Chinese viewer, because I've got a hot, you know, you know uh, what's that hot mail or whatever. So I need to interact with them. All the information I've gathered when I look into those data from my viewers, I think in China, the activities are very intense and frequent, no less than the Western world. And the information, what I can see since is that you got all sorts of craft in China, you have crafts in China, all sorts, all sorts of beings. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, what's going on in, regarding the Nanjing case, I need to see the video but i think it's it's uh, one of the ufo crafts from the you know the uh, uh, alien beings which i don't really know detail that much but the comments i want to respond to that one is that yes there are a lot there are daily sightings and everywhere thank you thank you and maybe you can jump into your favorite sighting and tell us about that and why it's your favorite sighting yeah um Regarding the, 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 there's a two, like I had a chat with Grant. Uh, could I just share that video sure. quickly with the viewer? Yeah, if you can share screen and show us the, the videos. I was going to show them, but uh, if you can show them on the screen and just talk over the videos. Just for 30 seconds. Sure. So uh, let me see how could I share, share screen. Okay. Da, 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 da. That's working. One. Yeah. 
Let me just go. Okay, so could you see the screen now? Uh, it's just a thumbnail. You have to expand it. Uh, yes. So what I'm going to show everyone is a triangular UFO hovering above Shanghai bond. The this one that happened. we have. Yeah, that's happened recently. You know, the, yeah. the, that, so that's the one. I want to show 30 seconds only, and then we can yeah. talk about this. Let me just show it now. Okay, I'm just quickly running over to share screen here so that I, I can show our audience what Shao wanted to show us. Okay, there we go. So they say, wow, holy, you know, holy cow, just look at this UFO. <laughs> Could we go to the two minute part, please? Maybe we can, yes. Okay. Hey, should I pause it there, Shao? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Okay. Um, I I think why we need to highlight this is that this is the latest famous UFO sightings we've got in China, Shanghai. And it just happened um, prior, literally immediately after the big celebration in China, like a 100 years communist establishment, something like that. So that just during that very sensitive period happened. And quite a few people saw it. So what people say in the video clip is they probably capture through their iPhone. They say, oh, holy moly, you know, I saw a UFO craft, triangular size. From my perspective, I do believe it's an authentic one. Reason being, as you can see, um, there is a comparison between, you know, what's in the sky and, you know, the landmark buildings. So they move the camera around mm -hmm. and the craft is actually behind the thin clouds. You can see the clouds actually slowly moving. So someone want to fake it, I found it would be quite difficult to do. And also that triangular crop is slightly moving a bit. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, like in my opinion, I do believe it's authentic one. Okay, wonderful. Another, yeah, another point I want to make is um, Grant might know, and you probably know, there's a, there's a, there's a Western guy, a Caucasian guy, he's actually in China, Shanghai. He did the so-called debunk version of this UFO, if you recall. Um, I have a different view about that because in my opinion, um, I think he's a fun guy, great guy to watch, lovely guy, but I have a different view about his final comments conclusion. Because if you watch his video, I can't remember, you know, his debunk video, he said, oh yeah, you know, I, uh, I surveyed quite a few pedestrians in Shanghai and they all say this is fake. No, no, no. The questions he asked to those Chinese are two. First, have you seen this UFO craft? Almost everyone say, no, we have not. We're not aware of that. Or they say, we're just arriving in Shanghai for fun. Mm -hmm. So they have not seen that craft. The second question he asked is, do you believe there's a UFO alien? And then people get all sorts of answers. And once his um, interview is finished, his conclusion is, come on guys, you see the people's reaction from China? It's a fake one. I mean, help me here, please. There's a no logical, uh, there's no logic here. The first one he's asked, People already responded to him. They are not aware of the sighting. They did not directly answer his question. Not saying, yes, I wait, or like uh, I saw it. No, they haven't seen it. And the second question is about whether or not there's a UFO or not. So that those two questions 
do not link with this video clip, which we just showed to your fans. So what I'm saying is you can't just judging by those irrelevant answers to debunk the fact that this is a, a fake UFO clip. There's a no connection between these questions and answers. Thank you. Now, the other thing that was interesting, let me make a comment on this because the video where he, remember he goes out and he says, let's find some pretty women to ask. Like he's basically looking for women to ask questions to. And he asked the woman on the bridge and that's when the security guy comes up and says, there are no UFOs, they're drones. Turn off the camera. It's illegal to run a camera here. And the other thing I found was interesting where he says, when he goes into the hotel, he says, oh, it happened here on the 15th floor in the, in the restaurant. And then suddenly he says, oh, it happened on the 27th floor. And he goes up to the 27th floor. And then he said, no, it happened on, on the roof on the 28th floor. And then he goes up to the 28th floor. And that's when he lies to the people where he gets caught. And he says, oh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, scared of an elevator. I, I, and that's why I came up the back stairs. And uh, so he, he has three different stories of, of where the video was taken. And um, his claim was that it was lights coming off the... Um, the building because the, the building was sort of triangle shaped but as you pointed out you can actually see the clouds going underneath the object that it's 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 in the it's in the clouds there seems to be no doubt about that yes so people like better don't be misled by those so-called debunk videos the pedestrian answers are so straightforward we do not know this video clip he did not show it to the people the second point is they say, oh, what is UFO? Or maybe, maybe not. But that's just open question. Do you believe in UFO or not? But none of those answers tied directly to that UFO sightings. So you cannot just quickly conclude like, oh, come on, guys, you have seen this is a fake one. I don't see the connection with those answers, with this video clip. So some people who just view those things, they don't even use their brain to think. They was like, oh, okay, that's a fake one then. People really need to use their brain to properly think. And I do agree with Grant. That's actually the second comment I want to make. In that uh, pedestrian interview, um, there's a sort of like a Chinese security guard of some sort. He actually said, remember, uh, don't film it, fine. The second point is China does not, he, he actually said that, kind of like a hint. He actually said, don't you know, China does not have UFO. China only have drone. You better remember that. So you go and leave, do not film. So he sort of give you an indirect answer. Yes, um, China will not admit to the fact that there is such thing called UAP or UFO. From their official point of view, there's only being classified or categorized as a drone. Okay, I have to ask you something about this because I've got two questions and uh, they're connected to two examples. So we're talking about, you know, how can we tell what's legitimate, what isn't, and then also the recognition or the acknowledgement of what is legitimate and what isn't in this field, right? So if, so for example, during my research to prepare for this interview, I was noodling around on the internet looking for videos of, you know, different sightings in China because the videos you sent me, sent me down that rabbit hole. I noticed that several of the videos, there's a little tag underneath them that says it's from CGTN, which is funded in whole or in part by the Chinese government. Yet these videos are showing UFO sightings in China. So what is that about? Because for at, just to come as a quick comparison, a lot of people in the US think that there's a narrative that's being deliberately uh, sent out to the American public that, you know, this, this is a fear-based thing, right? That we have to be ready to defend ourselves and that they're gonna come and attack us. And that's a way that they can get funding and there's all kinds of other reasons for that as well. So is this something the Chinese government is also doing? Why would they have videos on the internet that are partially funded by them? Thank you, I love your question. So sometimes it's like in the Western countries, you know, people capture something on their YouTube, oh, sorry, on their iPhone, you know, they send it to the local te uh, television channel, in this case could be CGTN. Um, and then they were just going to play it during the, you know, uh, a news time. So mind you, what happened is uh, China have an extremely controlled narrative on this topic. So when we talk about rough, roughly around, you know, um, 
any time prior to 2012 or 2013, those period, China are not that kind of extremely controlled on the topic. You can always see things, you know, come out. Even sometimes on their official television channels, you know, there's a exciting thing filmed by Joe Blow. This is what happened. Is that a UFO? Leave, leave it to you. So for them, it's okay. But during the recent years, there's a crackdown on any information that is not aligned with communist ideology. Because when you talk about UFO aliens, so you try to, you know, that seems like a quite different with materialistic world, 3D ideas, you know, three dimensional physical world. So that's why they don't like UFO because UFO, you try to introduce the idea that there's a multi-dimension, extra dimension involved. And there's other being are smarter than us who can travel to here. So this whole concept about ufology does not fit in the ideology of um, communist regime. So that's why there's a very little bit of hostile sort of, you know, whistling around the whole idea, but they can't really push the whole concept out. So what they do is neither deny or admit, but if you want to like a grassroots people like me who want to come out, they will shut you down. Uh, but every now and then they want to play one or two video clips. So what is this? We don't know. You know, leave it to you. At least we told you. So that's kind of very controlled in Africa. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Okay, that makes total sense. And I've got another example I wanted to ask you about as well. So there's a huge new dish, that uh, satellite dish that the Chinese have built, which is far, I think it's double the size of the, um, the Arecibo dish, I think, I believe that it's called. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So I know that. the size of that, it's enormous. And there was an interesting person who was brought in for consultation on that dish. And the person is a very popular science fiction writer in China. I don't want to mispronounce the name, but I probably will. Uh, Liu Sishin, I believe is the name. S. So, uh, sorry, L-I-U. And then the last name is C-I-X-I-N. So this, fiction, this science fiction writer is very, very popular. Popular author, sells lots of books. Oh, he yeah. I think I heard about his name. On the design of the dish. And what there's, there's kind of interesting connections here. So first of all, he wrote a book called uh, the three body problem, which actually Barack Obama, who's the president, who I believe yeah. is the closest to acknowledging that there are UFOs, you know, he said, oh, I can't talk about it or something like that. He, yes. re he read the three body problem and he said that it inspired him to have a cosmic perspective while he was the president of the US. And the same <laughs> author of that book is the person who was brought in to consult on this satellite dish. So it seems yeah. like there two different things going on, you know, like there are yes. these creative sort of interesting people that are becoming involved in some ways with this outreach to try to communicate with extraterrestrials. But as you're saying, absolutely nothing is being yes. acknowledged, yet this information is still getting out, right? People are, are posting videos and all kinds of, you know, uh, authors, this author has become outspoken on the issue. So he's not being quiet about it either. How does that, how do you reconcile those two yeah. total dichotomies, it's, opposites? It's actually a just drip drop information. The UFO clips, as you can see, normally floating around in the Chinese YouTube, this thing, you know, people take a shot of, you know, UFO put on top. So uh, it's not like absolutely no no you every now and then you can see one or two available on the platform but you know come on like you like youtube we've got thousands of people posting so much more than you know in china in terms of that also you mentioned if you pay attention china have a very controlled narrative so that means there's a different stages of disclosure the first stage at this stage is through the science fiction books or movies that guy he's a famous author for that science fiction books so that's what that's the narrative that they try to promote you know like a chinese it's a different culture place they're probably not as you know that kind of fully open so they want to introduce to the mass population read a science fiction book you know, that could be the possibility. Just watch Hollywood movie about science fiction movies. So that kind of gradually open you to the next stage, next stage. So China, I think that what, like what they're trying to do from my perspective, they are completely break down. Government want to do their own thing. They know heck a lot about what's going on. They may have a lot of projects, which we don't know. I don't want to know actually, otherwise I get in trouble. 
and there are grassroots people like us who try to you know connect with the like-minded people in China you know like you and the grant or maybe we want to share but the government attitude is like no I need to know what I need to do but you guys are civilians better be silent shut up don't talk about this you know that's the attitude like they know everything on top but they don't want to grasp for people to grow to expand in the community that is the major difference between china and the western world in the western world you got a government yeah they do their own thing they got their own black projects or whatever we don't know everything but you know every now and then you got a retired i don't know like a defense officer you know join the youtube so, oh that's what i know and you got so many grassroots people in USA, in Canada, in different countries, in, like, a, in, like an English speaking country to come out, have those YouTube shows. So it's not totally closed down. Whether in China, only the government are allowed to do what they need to do. Grassroots people like me, it's just, yeah, yeah. Very controlled. Interesting, narrative. interesting. Okay, I mean, it's just the, the, the you know, the dichotomy and the, the, the comparison between um, the illusion of what we're supposed to believe, you know, through the narrative that's delivered to us, as you've said, in these very deliberate little drops, you know, that little, little bits very, of breadcrumbs very, of information. Yeah. Great um, words totally resonate with me. It's a deliberate drip drop. That's the key words, you know, deliberate, intentional drip drop. Give it to you, but very little, even that little thing is very controlled. Yes, and it's all very supervised for sure. I mean, also in the United States and also in many other countries. So if we're touching on the connection between China and the US, and the US is, has been at the forefront of ufology in terms of having a voice in the community. Uh, you and I and Grant to all agree that there need to be more different kinds of voices. You know, we need to be coming together more to global community. So just if we're comparing these two countries here, um, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of similarity, although people might think that China and the US are very different in terms of how they operate, you know, politically, socially, there are actually a great number of similarities between the two, such as this controlled narrative. So part of that seems to be this recent UAP report that's come out, right, that people in the community who know what's going on were very underwhelmed by this report. Lots of other people got excited about it. It did have some, you know, some slightly, maybe, you know, tiny little bit of news, but really it was the same old thing repackaged. However, um, there are more and more interesting little tidbits of information about the background of this report that are coming out. And one of the things that's being talked about is that China may have been behind this report uh, coming out at all. So can you speak to that? Why would China be behind this report and what is going on there? Could I, if you don't mind, could I just share my view about that report from my perspective? about the uh, the American uh, report first, and then I'll touch on the China part. Uh, from my view, I think that's very well done from their professional, like, uh, you know, how the Pentagon released that information. Because from what I can see, they leave the ending as an open ending. They give themselves a lot of room to back up their story in the end. Because the videos, which they have released. Um, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, is not properly a true UFO craft. That could be a human made or could be, you know, joint force, like alien and human made craft. And then they, you know, they release it here with a neutral tone, like we don't know what that is. We do not um, admit and we do not deny. So they leave that as open ending. And then they say, maybe it's real, maybe not. But they also say there could be tied to you know the Russia or China. So how do I view these? Is they want to plan the future steps. If there's an alien, you know, um, arrival, they say, "See, guys, I told you, I do not know what that is. That could be extraterrestrials." If they're getting the you know um, kind of conflict with China um, or Russia, they can say that's a security threat. You know, they can use that against China and Russia. Say, look. I want extra funding just to equip my military power. So uh, they always can sh share that report, but from the defense point of view, to I see that report, sorry for the lack of a better word, to weaponize or to, to use that as a good excuse to get more funding for themselves. 
and yet they did a disclosure in a very indirect way yes and no you know open ending leave to everyone so i think it's a very tricky report i'm not very excited but that's the best they can do regarding china if you notice china always do things relatively slow like not really slow they just want to see what does other country you know handle certain sensitive topic first and then they will respond to you um and like a un resolution which you probably know they voted for years back in 1978 for the uh, uh in the support of study ufo phenomenon uh yes they voted for yes um, but I don't think China is the first country to come forward and say, oh my God, I'm so interested, I want to know. They always just remain in the background, watch, observe, and then say, yes, I want to support this or I disagree or I'm neutral. So I think that's the Chinese approach. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, I think that's you. just how they normally deal with certain things. Very cautious, very cautious slowly respond to any tricky or sensitive information, especially UFO related topics. So what do you think then, I mean, if we're thinking bigger, right, if we're going beyond the parameters of our planet, and we're thinking about our growing uh, ability to go into space and further into space and into other locations in space, um, that is definitely changing quite rapidly too, right? Because of the technology we're developing, but also because countries such as the US have an agenda, they want to weaponize space, right? So what is the Chinese perspective on that? What is the Chinese government's perspective? And I'll tell you part of the reason why I'm asking. There's a lot of blaming that goes on between China, Russia, and the US, right? That UFOs, oh, that's just uh, some kind of weaponry from China, or it's, a, it's weaponry from Russia that's come over here to the US and they're checking us out, or China says the same thing on Russia. So, so are, you know, is it possible that they are collaborating on something like this space project? Do you think that that could be going on or are they pretending to be enemies? Does China have the same agenda as the US and Russia, which both seem intent on weaponizing space? That's really my question. A bit um, more, sometimes I do that too much, but yeah. But no, 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 happy to answer that. <laughs> I think exopolitics is a such a big topic and the mm -hmm. worst thing I would have to dive into for another quite a few episodes, I mean. But I'm just asking you a question. I ask the view, I'm not answering, I'm just put out there as a question. How do we know that China don't have a treaties with ETs? I leave for people to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I, in terms of your question regarding they blend on each other to weaponize the space, Again, that could be just uh, firstly one excuse um, for them to weaponize their space army because you know space uh, to do with satellites. You know, if there's a major military conflict, they want to make sure that satellite does actually work properly. Otherwise, without a satellite, there's no war can fight with each other. So that's why they need to weaponize the space. But they may want to looking for a legitimate reason of why they need to weaponize the space. As you can see, like uh, USA now go, what's that called? The Space Army, something like that. Sorry, Space Force. And I don't know about Russia, but China is really actively, proactively sending out rocks to the space and all those crazy yeah. things. Uh, definitely, it seems like the space is a, is a high interest for them. And another, another thing for I thought about that, you know, uh, we all know that it's an incoming force flag about alien invasion and that's the final card that they're going to play so uh, yeah i think definitely every country says what's going to happen and you know if china know what usa going to do they obviously don't want to be lagging behind they want to you know better equip themselves for the uh, possible scenarios whether or not that so-called alien you know invasion alleged is a false flag or the real events, we don't know, but that at least give them a good excuse to weaponize from the ocean to the surface and to the sky, you know, to the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just all taxpayers' money, you know, like 
That's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is incredibly financially motivated, I think, regardless of where it's taking place and what government is involved, uh, for sure. So there's a whole new kind of market that's opening up, which is fascinating and sort of intriguing and somewhat concerning at the same time. So if we're going back to um, this topic of legitimacy, I wanted to ask you about these videos that you sent us, um, there's several different locations in the videos where there have been really significant sightings. You said you sent us one of the biggest UFO uh, incident that's ever happened in Chinese so far in China so far. That's called, forgive me, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Hangzhou Airport. Did I say that right, Hangzhou? Yeah, yeah it's a Hangzhou Airport. So it's Hangzhou, the second tier city in China, not as big as Beijing, Shanghai, but second tier. Like it's still pretty big. Yeah. Uh, city. China, yes, huge, yes. huge incident. I mean, there's there's many that you sent us. So my question is, if China is not, uh, you know, the Chinese government itself is not acknowledging yet that these are real and that this really is happening and what their involvement is and all that stuff, then how if 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 a if a video if a sighting that's caught on video is legitimate legitimized and seen as being authentic, how is it authentic authenticated? Who is it in China or who is it? maybe outside of China, such as yourself, that is able to evaluate these videos and authenticate them? Like what, what is the process for giving it that? Scale? I love your question. You asked so many interesting questions. And uh, when I look into this event, I think um, the aliens are very smart because when you look at it, when they landed in that airport, it was not a you know, low key play secretively I landed in the middle of the night, like everybody sleep. They pick a time around 7 or 8 p.m., you know, when everybody off work at home and during the peak time in that airport. And I can tell you for that, that case, actually, it's being reported in uh, China mainstream medias. And, and that incident, when it happened, as you can see from the videos, a lot of people, I mean, the, uh, the local residents have seen it. You know, they use, you know, everybody got like a smartphone these days, they just pick and take a camera of it, so take a picture of it. So that's the point. I sense that alien know the government will debunk it and tell everybody, come on, it's nothing just more than lights in the sky. It's just, you know, whatever projection. So that's why they pick a peak time after work, seven to eight o'clock. When they arrive, everybody in the local restaurant can see it, lights spinning down on the ground, such a big showcase. So I think that's a pre-planned stage for those aliens. They want the local notes, this is a real deal. So it's not going to be one person come out and say, I've seen this. It's like hundreds of people seeing it. It's a news media everywhere during uh, back in 2010, around that time. Everybody reported, everybody share on their Chinese bloody YouTube channels. It's really difficult for the local government to say, this is not real, it's too difficult because so many people are seeing it. So I think it's the alien who actually planned this. So answer your question, how do you know it's authentic or not? Firstly, we can just chat. You know, like lawyers always talk about evidence and the witness, when you go to the court, you need that two things. Evidence, yes, we got quite a few original video clips, not just one person, quite a few people filming the same, uh, the same object, the same time from different angle about the one incident. So it's really hard to debunk those evidence at once. It's not filmed by one person, but quite a few from different angles, from different floors, you know, from, mm -hmm. from different angles. So the evidence is hard to debunk. Uh, debunk. Secondly, you got witness. You got hundreds of people, the local residents saw it when it's just beaming the lights on the ground and everybody come out like, what is this, what is this? So when you look at it, we got the evidence, the unreasonable doubt evidence, we got the witnesses, so much information here that make the government really hard to debunk this incident. So are, and, people, are these people who are, you know, posting these videos online and who are being interviewed by, let's say, journalists, right? You said that this, this airport one, which is the biggest story so far, was in the mainstream news. So I'm assuming there were people that were interviewed who said, yes, I saw this thing, and they would have described it. Are these people ever threatened? Do they ever have 
the experience after that of being told to be quiet or if the government kind of like, well, you know, as you're saying, the internet is a powerful tool, people know how to use it and there's not, there's only so much we can do to control this narrative. Are these people ever threatened or does the government kind of go, oh, well, you know, that one's out of our hands? Great question. Two weeks ago, I had a conversation with my friend on WeChat, you know, the Chinese WeChat is like WhatsApp. We yeah. were talking about that case. I say, hey, and I told him I sent that video clip to Grant and, you know, we're going to play on the YouTube. And I said, oh, I just hope some witness can come out. And the, the girl who I know is, she said, yeah, I know someone, you know, but that person holding a public, like a public servant job. So she's a, a not my friend, but someone I, like my friends know was a local resident who actually witnessed writing. So she, maybe, I don't know whether she have a video clip or not, but she is one of the witnesses. Mm -hmm. So she can't come out because she's a public servant. If she come out to your channel, she may lose her job. Public servant means she's working for the government. So you see a lot of fears in the community because if they come out, there are consequences. Um, all I can share about that incident, even I can tell you, whatever we share right now is only the tip of the iceberg. But that's how far we can go. Talk about the sight in the sky. And this is one of the most famous cases, and in my opinion, is the most important case in China. And there are some saying that they may have a treaties. I don't know. I don't want to comment on that. But as you can see, um, I guess I'm pretty lucky in Australia, but I still need to watch out. But uh, there are people who is really in the know. They have fear to come out to talk about, you know, this happened to me. This is the mm. They can't because they are. Wow, yeah. I think we should show that video and, actually the uh, airport incident. We can show it right now. So let me pull that up. All right, so I'm about to share my screen here and we can show this incredible video. It's really, really, really something. All right, here we go. Do we know who took this video? Uh, one of the residents, I believe, okay. uh, in the local area. And there are quite a few video clips captured from different angles um different distance about these crafts and you, as you can see there are quite a few the two round balls i don't know could be a sphere size could be uh, uh they have made a tree <laughs> who knows but the middle one is the key and how um, long did it go on for for i think i've been told for quite a long time and uh, what i've been told is that that cigar shape whatever you want to call it that one's actually landed in the airport, wow. they actually bend it down. So uh, what's happened after that is not for me to comment. Just to just to, just to clarify for um, people who are listening and are not able to see the video right now, what, we're, what we've been looking at is we're looking at a very large, uh, almost flat looking bright white disc that is flashing a very bright beam of light down at the airport, an area at the airport. And the beam of light is opening and closing, kind of becoming wider and then narrower, wider, narrower, it's doing it over and over again. Meanwhile, there are two bright orbs of white light on either side of the disc. And there's also this little white uh, light ball of light that's smaller than the other two that's kind of zipping around. It looks like it's got a job to do. It's sort of zipping around very fast. So just to give everyone a clear idea, that's what we're uh, looking at at the moment. And I'm gonna bring us back to the main screen again here. Um, give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. Okay, so Xiao. Um, if you would like to tell us more about the other videos that you sent, I mean, there's some really incredible, incredible ones, such as, uh, well, there's the cloud one, actually, which might not seem that remarkable because it's not actually a ship, but the way that it was moving in the sky was just amazing. Would you mind describing that one and maybe a couple of other ones? Yeah, the cloud one, I think it's just the full fun. I, uh, um, I think it's not super significant because you can see those things, you know, the UFO, uh, you know, uh, masquerade themselves as a, as a cloud, you know, 
put themselves in the cloud and or any so, but how clear it is, you know, it's it's really hard to debunk. Um, I just found it fascinating. And the Nanjing, the Nanjing UFO sighting, I I do believe my favorite is a is a is a authentic one. I found it interesting. So the point why I'm sending those like small clip about those UFO um, clips is that. There are a lot of sightings. We, I, um, I don't want to just focus on lights in the sky, but I want to leave it to the viewers to think about it. If we have that amount of frequent, intense UFO sightings, that literally means we have a lot of interactions with all sorts of beings in China as well. Mm. But not all of them are reported. Funny enough, I'll go back to my uh, last interview I did with Grant. Um, it's about the personality traits. Because what I found about Chinese is Chinese is not like a Western people, you know, something happened to them the other day, you know, they want to say, oh, so now let's jump online and talk about it and film me so everybody can watch our, you know, discussions, you know, what you learn, what I learn, exchange information we learn from each other. I think that's it's actually a really good way to you know, learn through your journey, but Chinese ways different. Asians are more introvert, reserved. So they may have a massive experience happen and maybe there are quite a few very authentic insiders, but they want to be more reserved. When I come out, you know, I came out quite a few years ago and they send me all those emails, but they say, oh, let me tell you what happened to me. You know, I'm in contact with this being from that star system, this and this. This is what they told me about China, da, da, da. And I said, great. How about you jump on my friend's you know, platform and share your information? Mm -hmm. And the next day you hear nothing. Oh, they say, oh, no, 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 that's fine. You know, I just want to share with you. So it's very introvert and kept everything for themselves. Yes, there is a, you know, a very deliberate trip drop information control has you know by the government but also to do with the personality traits of asian especially chinese they don't want to come out to talk about it yeah i mean that makes me wonder um or do you do you think that chinese people in china or maybe outside of it because of course we bring our culture with us wherever, wherever we go um do you think they would be less likely to talk about it in person and more likely to express themselves on the internet so for example the uap report you know with there a lot of sudden activity and conversation going on on the internet that might not have been able to happen out in public at a cafe or in someone's home they might not have felt as secure being able to to have discussions there would that be the case when it came to something like the UAP report that that garnered so much excitement, you know, there had to have been conversations happening about that. But I'm curious if it was only it was mainly on the internet. You know, if people feel more comfortable, more safe, or secure being able to express these things on the internet under a hidden identity, or they can disguise their IP rather than you know meeting up with friends in Shanghai at a cafe and talking about it openly around the table. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, in China, there's a, I think there's a law, but every city is slightly different, funny enough. If you want to group up people for, I think for Shanghai, I could be wrong, more than 40 people or something like that. Um, you need to go to the local police station, get a permit, say, you know, we are going to have, a, you know, some kind of activities, you, you, you know, even for hobby catch up uh, to discuss X, Y, and Z. So the point I want to make is it's not that kind of easy for them to like we have a support group in Australia, you know, uh, like, let's catch up 20 people, 25 people, 40 people to talk about this. You can't because you need to get a permit from the local police. Let's catch up. Um, so otherwise you will be labeled as illegal rallies. Mm -hmm. And you see, that's very difficult for them to even meet in the cafe in China, even to talk about these things but you can always catch up like two or three girlfriends catch up go for shopping you say what i bought that's okay but if you want to do a say bible study or you want to catch up for ufo sky watching or whatever right. you need to get a local permit that makes our job like the grassroots community members extremely difficult because in order to promote a, a, a hobby interest or something you want to call it it's hard because you have to wait for the local permit. It's just lots of burdens involved. The second part about that is whether or not you can use a pen name. 
believe me, I have tried. So I told them, I said, no, if you don't want to come out writing as a real name, real occupation address, why don't you use your pen name? They use a pen name, you know, I don't know, Alice in Wonderland or whatever. Come out or even, you know, uh, don't show your face or even just write an article, use a pen name. Um, the, there are some improvement, but still people are very reserved because what happened in China is the internet police, they can eventually trace back who wrote that article. So again, it's to do with people's fear about being exposed. There are uh, uh, consequences will go with them. What, so if it was someone, very, what if it was a, a huge movie star or, you know, the, the author we were discussing earlier, really successful, very popular uh, celebrities, if, if one of them was to yeah. come and say, I had a sighting, what, would that do anything to, like, what would be the effect yes. of that? Yeah. yeah. So there is a very famous, um, I think, a movie maker in China. Um, so it called Emo Zhang, the last name of Zhang. He's very famous in China. It's like a Spielberg in the Western world. Like he's a very famous movie maker. So I think one day he was being interviewed and somehow he talked about the UFO. He said, you know, when I was young, I saw a spear shaped crab in the sky and then I blacked out for five minutes. And I do believe it's a UFO. So he said that, well, it being it, but what happened is it's all shut down later on. So you cannot find that link anymore. So you have people like that, very famous talk about it. Uh, it may get into the public, and, but you have to save it very quickly and have to download a clip. Otherwise, you know, one or two weeks later, it may go gone. You know, it's oh. just- uh, so Those people can still be disappeared? Like even if they're- Oh, no, 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 they can't. Like uh, they're yeah, okay. famous. Oh. So uh, you really can't do that to those people. But, you know, they might be friendly reminded better not to talk about in the future. So I only have seen one interview that he did with the local television you know, host talk about that subject, that, but he never brought that, that topic again. Um, yeah. <laughs> interesting, interesting. And there must be, I mean, I'm sure the internet goes nuts whenever something happens. You know, there must be all this underground conversation and excitement. So what about, for example, the, the UN resolution that China proposed? Please tell us about that and you know, what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I think it's more about, you know, stick with the party line approach, because back in 1978, when Jack Vallée, is that Jack Vallée or his like a colleagues promote the idea, you know, they lobby, you know, whatever they say, yeah, hey, maybe we can have a resolution focus on that. So they proposed that and a few members of the UN um, voted for yes, yes, they need to study the UFO phenomenon. But China is being one of the permanent member of UN. And you know, if they see all the major players want to play this game or want to participate in this UFO research, um, they just voted for yes. Because for the government perspective, there's a technology involved. You know, they may want to do reverse engineering. But again, it's my comment, you know, it's it's my opinion, you know, they also want to look at things from different perspective. Whereas like grassroots people like me, maybe just for a hobby focus, like, oh, that's interesting. Let's do some study then. They may have a different um, political approach, which I don't know, but they just want to stick with the party line. Everybody want to do the research in UFO. They will say, yes, let's do it then. Um, I don't think China was one of the major push for this resolution to be passed. Wow. They just one of the many, uh, you know, kids in the blocks, like say, oh, if you guys want to focus on that, you know, count me in that kind of approach. I think they're more passive, um, passively getting involved rather than proactively. Yes, let's do it. Interesting, yeah. interesting. And Grant is saying to me in, um, in the chat that the US did not sign on for that. You know, it did not sign on for that. Oh. And, and then also he's reminding me that back in 1977, this is actually, I did not know this. I found this fascinating. Back in 1977, 1978, um, Grenada proposed to, at the request of Grenada, Grenada uh, it was proposed to establish an agency to look into UFOs and related phenomena, right? This is this is uh, a request made of the UN back in 1977, 1978, ages ago, right? So once again, we're reminded that this is not new. It's not a new yeah. effort. What is, what is 
the efforts that are being made now by different countries, by the international community, by people on the ground in ufology, by leaders in ufology, you know, these are not new requests, right? Because this kind of thing has been pushed forward many times before and just shoved under the table over and over again. So I, I want to ask you if you feel like um, considering what you said about Chinese culture, the Chinese mindset, you know, the control that the Chinese government has over the people, but also the conservatism and the sort of withdrawn personality, cultural personality of the people. Do you feel like the Chinese government and citizens of China feel encouraged by the fact that so many other countries are now coming out and saying that, yes, this is going on. Yes, you know, there are UFOs that have been sighted by our, our military. Yes, we have uh, made pro proposals to the UN or to whatever organization to have research, you know, done on this topic and funding put into this. Do you feel like China has been sort of waiting on this to happen in order to to also come into the community, or do you think it was just inevitable because of the rapidly rising number of sightings and the internet as a tool for the average person? I'm more prone towards your second um, perspective. I think they've been dragged into it. So they have to admit the fact that this is the hot topic right now, given uh, the recent release by the you know, Pentagon about that UAP report. I think they've been literally dragged and forced into looking into this topic like, okay, USO has, re uh, you know, U uh, USA have released that report. What could we do in response to that report? So I, I think it's very, um, common or very usual that for China not to respond earlier than that USP report because they want to see what's being written in the USP report and they want to see how USA going to approach that issue and, and then they can address you know in response to that report and then you know so China was one or two step uh, later behind not because they're using slow but they just want to wait and see first think about their strategy then respond to it um, I don't know their approach, but from my feeling, I think they will take even more conservative approach towards the, the UFO topic. You know, the, the debunking video that that gentleman did, um, there's a security guard say, remember, China does not recognize UFO. China does not have UFO. China only have drone. Mm -hmm. So he actually sent you in a signal that don't talk about UFO because China will not admit to you. China will only brush it as, oh, it's just a drone, you know, that's just a drone. So uh, I think that was clearly, cleverly um, told by that guard on the bridge. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. I mean, it, it really is just fascinating watching what's happening in China. You know, I mean, it, it's amazing to see how the internet and also just kind of the zeitgeist right now is encouraging people to come out in ways that are uncommon for people in China to, you know, to be open and also that the courage involved, right? They know what the risks are and they're still willing to do that, to, to speak up about all kinds of things, not just UFOs, you know, human rights. The, things. So now I've been like uh, two points I want to make. The first point is, uh, believe me, there's a lot of people in our community in China, they are very excited that time about this report to come out. You know, people like, yay, my God, finally, somebody is going to release something. I can't wait, I can't wait. There's a big reaction, even in the Chinese community about this report. They're just hoping, regardless which country, they are not really into politics at all. They just want to hear more about UFO and aliens. Oh, well, we, we want to know, we want to know. But you know what happened, that report doesn't, not very meaty stuff come out. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see that people in our community, regardless in which country, including China, mm -hmm. um, they are very, have that positive attitude towards the disclosure of UFO alien movement. They are in full support. Um, in terms of the you know, courage, and you have no idea how much negativity backlash, politics, sabotaging, you know, my name, you know, in China, it's all things happen. So it's not easy. I've been, you know, have life threatening situation, this and that, and it's really annoying, but it is what it is. Um, I don't do this for famous or friend because mm -hmm. I may receive more, you know, uh, more severe consequences 
But nevertheless, I believe it's the courage of soul that you have to see someone in China to come out to talk about it. So I just need to be mindful about you know how much I could talk and how much I can't talk. So uh, I wish you know people could show some kind of empathy to Chinese. Um, we are all in the same community, and we do respect the Western, uh, you know, the, the brothers and sisters, and we do watch your channels. But the reason why they, they don't see so many Chinese is because, you know, uh, safety concerns and the fears involved. Yeah, um, it's very difficult. Yes. Yes, and and I actually want to take this opportunity to just express gratitude, which I think is very important to do, generally speaking, but specifically in this context, because of the risk that people are undertaking and yourself, you know, um, to, to speak up about this, it is not, Grant and I are both very aware and many, many, if not all people who listen to this will be aware that, you know, this is not, this is not something you can do easily, that this is a risk, this is something that does compromise your safety and that it takes a great deal of courage and passion and dedication about this topic to do that. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And also I wanna pay respect to the people that you know of in China who have been insiders and have tried to bring this to light and have disappeared or been harmed or threatened in some way that does need to be recognized. And, you know, I think on a, on a bigger level too, because this is a very, very important time for our species, for our planet, because of this growing connection with our universal friends, let's call them that, um, you know, it is all the more inspiring, this courage. So it's really, really important, I think, to recognize that. So thank you. Yeah. And thank actually you. on it's that. Really yes, thank um, you, thank you. I think the Chinese viewer would also pay the same um, respect and gratitude to you and the grant for allowing us to share what's really going on in China. And I can tell you, I really touched my heart, you know, those people um, in China, the insiders, they, they went through tremendous things that you know you could imagine uh, it's, it's very tough for them yes 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 and you are someone who gives them hope right you are someone who is a voice for them outside of the country on topics that are this important so will this video make it back to china will people in china be able to watch this interview and understand it they could, uh, they could, but uh, let's see. Some people may be able to jump the Chinese internet firewall. You may not know like Google, Facebook, YouTube, and you name it, WhatsApp, all banned in China. Right. So uh, there might be quite a few people able to jump the firewall. They may watch it and then they may be just uh, um, post it in China. But again, uh, my name, I've been classified, I've been told as a, a sensitive a taboo name. So every time when people try to upload my my YouTube like uh, uh, like interviews, they will never get approval. It's like YouTube, they will take it down or label it yellow or whatever. So uh, let's see, at least I can share information with my uh, uh, Western friends, um, a true insight about what's going on in China. So in terms, in terms of people understanding the content of this video, would, would automatically, would Chinese captions show up if it was online? Okay. okay. Yes, there is a caption. Um, thank you for bringing that up. So there's a subtitle parts. Um, I think they can get 70% accuracy. Um, I think that's good enough. At least they know what's being discussed, you know, briefly. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty good, but yeah. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So I thought one last question for you. We want to bring it back to you because we really do admire the work that you're doing and your courage and your, you know, just being in the position that you are to validate the experiences of so many people and be able to help them and tell them, you know, you are not crazy. I'm right there with you as an experiencer, right? You've been there and you know what it's like to have one of these experiences and try to make sense of it. So on that note, my last question for you is, what else have you experienced yourself in this world of ufology or just the general paranormal, you know, high strangeness, what else have you yourself experienced in your life that has helped you to stay on this path? Um, in terms of the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, paranormal. Um, I went through the dark night of the soul period and came out, which is not easy. The things I learned uh, from all those uh, so-called paranormal activities, which from my view is quite normal, happen to you and happen to Grant, uh, is that people need to change. You know, as I mentioned in my last interview, I was very stubborn people. 
I can have a same hairstyle for years and don't want to change. So the information I learned from my life experience and even those beings who told me is this is your soul lesson shell to learn how to change yourself. Because if you don't learn this, you cannot graduate in this cycle of evolution. So mm -hmm. I have to force myself a lot of time to change, change myself, the hair color, the hair, you know, style, uh, improve myself and change, you know, my, you know, improve my shortcomings. I'm not a perfect person, but I think it's very important. What I learned from my experience through the years is face the reality, admit to who we are and change. Another message is what I actually heard from the beings is that we are truly, truly live in this end time right now. And I don't think there's many years or not even many years, could be months, who knows, left for us to improve ourselves. And I do believe they will have a such, it's called the major events. People will say, what is this event? So in my opinion, I think the events, uh, the event is a big event that encapsulates all the smaller events like full disclosure, ascension, rupture, whatever you call it, it may happen simultaneously at the same time on the same day. Boom, it's just happened. It's just people don't have time to think. It just I believe that's that's going to happen in the next two two and a half years i don't think we even got a three years yet to be honest when you receive this information how does it come in i mean do you hear a voice are you getting downloads how do how do you receive this kind of communication or information all sorts could be out of body experience like a very lucid out of body experience like you stand literally outside of your body and look yourself ah that's my body you know then they have a conversation with you in the room and uh it could be you know, on the spacecraft they may show you the situation you know and uh, they will talk to you, you know there's no time left you have to get yourself prepared you know you have to improve this no time left the message that i got a lot in the recent months not just for myself but also for the chinese the people that are still in contact with it's the common message is one sentence get ready it's about to happen and i believe believe a lot of viewers right now they may get a similar message in the last one year time maximum the message is be ready it's almost there be ready it's almost there mm -hmm. so you know i think they refer to the soul preparedness we need to prepare for what's coming it's very exciting it's incredibly exciting i mean i we just feel we are i think so lucky you know to be alive at this time it is a frightening time in the world in many ways but also because uh, everything is duality in this dimension, right? When it when it's super scary, it's also really super exciting because there's some incredible stuff that's going on, and we are coming together as a global community. So thank you for sharing that message because that is one that needs to be heard by the global community, and many other people share that experience of having heard that message. Right? The time is now. We need to be doing this work now, and we need to be doing it together. So thank you so much, Xiao, for being here to talk with us and to share your experiences and your knowledge. And uh, if there's anything that you'd like to say to the audience before we say goodnight, please take the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Firstly, I really want to thank you and the grant for inviting me. And thank you so much for giving a Chinese a, a, a platform to voice out, you know, what's happening in China right now, especially in our community. Um, I want to send a public message to everyone. So for those Chinese, you know, in either in mainland China or, you know, a massive population Chinese in America, in Canada, a lot of them, you know, Chinese American, American Chinese, um, you know, Australian Chinese. There are a lot of those in overseas who are very awakened, have a massive experiences. I am ask you, urge you to come out, mm -hmm. to share, to share with people about your experience, because we need those brave soul to come forward. I'm just one of many but I'm waiting for Japanese, Korean, Chinese yes. people, Asians, just you got to grow some balls, just bloody come <laughs> out, you know, contact brand, contact, submit, you know, show your emails, just say, hey, if you're Asian, if you've got the authentic information, share, yeah. because we need information from Asians. We need to know what's going on. And I bet there's a lot of 
insiders in Asian countries, not just China, could be Japan or could be Korea, you have to come out to share. And we as a soul have the obligation of duty of care to our country, but also to humanity. So you need to share what you have. I could be the, I can't be the only person, you know. So that's the message I want to share to those Asians. I so agree. Grow some balls, especially men, Asian men. Do something, please. <laughs> yes, Thank you. that's my yes. last message. Yes. yes, absolutely. I mean, there's no better time than now to just start living authentically, right? For whatever yes. reason, it benefits yourself and everyone around you. But for this topic specifically, yeah, that the time is especially important and especially ripe and potent right now. So again, we are so lucky to be part of it. And, and thank you for being here, Shao, really. I hope we get to talk again. Uh, you know, if there's anything that we can do to support your work, we are absolutely happy to do that. Uh, the, the breadth of voice is very important in this community. We have this one dominant voice, really mostly the United States, and we need to make it more of a global, a global interconnected community where multiple voices are sharing these experiences. So thank you for being here and being part of that. Please come back and we will continue to work together and we're happy to support you in any way that we can. So keep us posted thank about you. what you're doing. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Such a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart right now. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Gren. Keep thank in touch you. and uh, let me know. I'm happy to patch up um, different ufologists in different yes. countries. And let's thank let the information roll. Thank you. Th thank you very much for setting up the other interviews. We're doing one with uh, China tomorrow. Uh, we okay. have one next weekend. Uh, we will continue to interview these people because we are all just one race on the earth. We will we will follow. So I really appreciate the fact that you've linked us into the Chinese community, to the Asian community Thank you. Uh, through Japan and China. And uh, you've done fantastic work and um, anything we can do to help you. Uh, we're honored to know you and um, you've done a wonderful job in terms of moving this out. And we, we will do. And thank you very much to Sinead for doing this interview today. I feel much relieved because I had lots of trouble with the um, with my internet that's about to hopefully get fixed next week. But um, I don't have to worry anymore. I have a fantastic interviewer who uh, did much better job than I would have done in the interview. So thank you, Sinead. <laughs> I'm thank not you, sure about that, yeah, but I'm very, great very great happy much. it worked out well. Thank you. And, you know, I just always appreciate being able to do this work with you. You know, it's my favorite thing. So yes, thank you to you too. There's lots of thank yous. It's a mutual appreciation society going on here right now. <laughs> but uh, Xiao, once again, you are awesome. We are so pleased to have had you. Stay in touch. And to everyone, good night. And thank you so much for listening.